Uh, before we start, I'd like to have Mr. Machado, who's representing the Chancellor, to say a few words on behalf of the institution. Shout out to you, Mr. Machado. Well, thank you, Dr. Nathan. I'm sure we're sure that for those of you that do not know me, I'm the Executive Director of Operations for the School of Medicine. But I've spent 40 years in the hospital, and I can't forget the good old days of, uh, of running that facility. Again, thanks uh, for attending the fifth annual Woodruff uh, Symposium. I know that we've got a host of uh, great speakers. In fact, I had the opportunity to meet them just a couple minutes ago. So it, what a wonderful occasion. You know, I was asking one of the uh, staff members in the department, how did this get started? And it was a grateful patient, Lorene Woodford, who experienced a brain aneurysm about three or four years ago and through a calling procedure that was done in the angiography lab, the lady's life was spared. And the family wanted to express their gratitude by establishing this professorship so that we would be exposed, could take the opportunity to be exposed to cutting the edge uh, techniques in the field of neurosurgery. And certainly we appreciate the, uh, the guest speakers that we have here today. Just one word about the Department of Neurosurgery here. I can remember some 26 years ago as we were recruiting Dr. Danda, I think you were about 27, 28 at that, that real young fella. We'll leave it at that to see what, has, what the department has brought to this community. Not only do they serve the three state areas surrounding us, but also internationally, patients that are seen from across the world. And I must share with you a personal experience. I oftentimes call either he or a member of the department about following up on a referral or calling a patient back. And the response that I get always will take care of that today. I, I can remember looking at Dr. Smith just a few years ago, a poor prisoner who was having severe back problems, couldn't walk. He called that uh, correctional officer back that same day and the patient was on the surgical table two days later. So that's the kind of experience and the philosophy that the department has brought to this community and certainly where the medical school is uh, obligated or in grain for that, most appreciate. Also the educational role that they provide to the medical students and turned in resident. I have the opportunity to attend his annual going away party for the residents and to hear those gentlemen and ladies speak of their gratitude to each faculty member for the exposure and the training that they've had is, is certainly remarkable and gratifying to me as a member of the healthcare team. Well, with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Nanda, and uh, I wish you the best in, uh, in this symposium today. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Joe. Joe is like the Uncle Joe. Anytime we have anything we need, we go to Uncle Joe, and he ran the hospital for years, and he was just an amazing resource. He still is. If we have a problem, we always go to him. He still fixes it for us. So I want to quickly tell you a little bit about, um, where is this, is this how it goes forward? Just to give you a quick history, that's the Woodard family in the center there for all of you. This is a very philanthropic gift on behalf of this family. She had an aneurysm coil, she was very grateful and they wanted to institute something that would be a legacy for the medical school for a long time. And we've been very blessed, we've had this is the fifth one, so we've had three international speakers every year. We pick one person from each continent. So you can see uh, last year, Dr. Ture came from Turkey. Eka Vahapramano came from Indonesia. He's Indonesia's best neurosurgeon. And we have a speaker from Switzerland. We've had Brazil. So we've had a really good panoply of great speakers, and we're very fortunate for that. Um, and I have the pleasure to introduce uh, Ying Mao, who is uh, who's probably one of China's best known neurosurgeons. He went to, he's from Shanghai, he went to Shanghai Medical School, Huashan Hospital, which if you look at any ranking system in China is considered one of the best hospitals, like the Mass General of, of China. Uh, it's an amazing place, you know, we think our place is busy, our shop is busy, because we do 3,500 cases, 
you go to their shop and they're doing over 10,000 cases and they're not doing any spine. I mean, they're just a big intracranial operation. Uh, amazing, gifted neurosurgeons there. He graduated from Harshan, did his training there, he then did fellowships at University of Michigan and at Harvard. Uh, he went back. He's a real technical maestro. He does very fine bypass surgeries. He does skull base surgery. I've seen his videotapes. He's really gifted. Uh, and also, he's been a real leader for Chinese neurosurgery. He's the vice president of Chinese Neurosurgical Society, involved in the skull base society. Uh, a wonderful leader. He hosted us last year with the Society of University Neurosurgeons. And um, he had everybody in Shanghai there. It was an amazing party, and I think it was one of our best meetings. So we're very grateful for somebody who was a real leader in Chinese neurosurgery to be here. You know, one of the best known neurosurgeons in this country is probably Spetzler, so I always tease him that he's China's Spetzler. So without much further ado, Professor Yang Mao. Good morning. Uh, dear Professor Nanda and uh, dear the ladies and gentlemen, it is my great honor to be here. I just feel nervous that uh, this is my first time to to talk in the uh, in, in the server board, and actually I just put the uh, I just have some talk about the uh, the bypass in the vascular disease. First of all, I should say some words about uh, Professor Nanda. Professor Nanda is a really good friend. It's a uh, it's really good friend of Chinese neurosurgeons. I think that almost all the Chinese neurosurgeons uh, knew, uh, knew uh, the, uh, Professor Nanda very much. And every time, he just have a wonderful speeches in, in Chinese Neurosurgical Society. And this is just the, uh, the pictures showing that the, uh, he just with the uh, basketball player Yao Ming He's from Shanghai, so at that time I just invite him to attend the meetings and I just had a picture so you can see the, uh, uh, the, the height difference between the... Uh. <laughs> Actually, I know that Professor Nanda is a very tall and a very and a giant person. <laughs> so I just say some words about the, uh, our department. Our department is uh, located in Shanghai. It's uh, affiliated to Fudan University and it's about uh, 600 beds for neurosurgery. And we have uh, 120 beds for NICU. When NICU, and the, right now we have uh, 25 ORs, and we are constructing a new campus. So totally, we have uh, 34 ORs for neurosurgery, and we have two intraoperative MR. And every day, we uh, we every year we have 40,000 cases for outpatient, and usually with the patients mostly is from the other cities, or from uh, in China, and 10% is the international patient. Who the patient was the citizen just stayed in Shanghai is from the other countries, and this is just uh, the study uh, of the uh, brain tumors so we treated it within these 30 years, and we will find that every year we have a glioma is over uh, 1,500, and meningioma is almost 1,300, and pituitary it's over 1,000, and meningioma is all kind of uh, uh, the disease, and we just have uh, the 600 uh, the aneurysm clipped or coiled every year. And this is just for our department. We have uh, uh, four campus. The North Campus for the uh, public service. East Campus is for the fire service. And the Central Campus is right now. So we are just to deal with some difficult case. And the West Campus is just under constructing. And it's interesting that all kind of campus was designed by the, some, uh, some, uh, some experts from the United States. So I think that it looks like the, uh, the hospitals in, in, in the United States, and especially for the West Campus, we just uh, designed by the, some people from the, uh, Los Angeles. So it looks like the uh, campus in the uh, in United States. And finally, in the uh, end of uh, last year, uh, next year, we will have uh, 800 beds for neurosurgery in the 40 operation rooms and one central lab for the neurosurgery. So today, my topic is about the bypass application to cerebral vascular disease. I think right now, uh, even though there's a, most of the cases are treated by the endovascular treatment, but still they have some usefulness of the bypass in complex intracranial aneurysm and also cerebral ischemia and Moyamur disease. It is well known that the, uh, for the complex intracranial aneurysm, 
is defined as the uh, those aneurysm could not be coiled, uh, could not be direct clip. So we should uh, try to use the uh, some uh, alternative way to treat such kind of uh, aneurysm. And the rupture rate for such kind of aneurysm is about 40% within five years. And the mortality rate of this patient, of this patient is about, uh, it's, it's over uh, 30%. So uh, I, I prefer to use the radial artery as a graft vessels for the ECIC bypass for such kind of patient. And usually we just have a different kind of bypass. For example, the, this is the ECIC bypass, so we call it hyper bypass. So we use the, uh, uh, we just started from the, uh, uh, the uh, ICA from the neck and to have the bypass at the uh, branches of the MCA. And also after the bypass we can, we can stop the uh, blood supply from the, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the external part and then to try to accrue, to, uh, to trap the aneurysm in the ICA part. So right now so we have a standardized bypass construction with the high flow, media flow, or low flow bypass. Uh, usually we use the different method. So one is from the uh, ECA, ECA and one from the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the stump of the uh, SDA. And some we have the, have the branches of the SDA. So it's called high flow, media flow, and a, uh, uh, a low flow. So the challenges for bypass right now is that the first, is it necessary in the futures? We will find that every time when we talk about the flow diverters, the flow diverter is preferred treatment for the complex aneurysm right now for, uh, for ICA uh, aneurysm. But still, I think that bypass was the last choice for some patient. So we think about whether the, uh, uh, the flow diverter is safe or not. This is just the, uh, the data showed on the, uh, on the Journal of Neurosurgery, showed that the, uh, uh, the uh, fluid diverters may have some uh, complications right now still. And also the, uh, the papers on the neurosurgery said, said the, uh, the right now it's not the correct time to determine whether the, uh, whether the fluid diverter is safe, uh, safe or not. So we could not have uh, enough uh, quality evidence and the second one is the how we can we treat so we can treat such kind of aneurysms. So uh, I just published papers on the word neurosurgery is talking about the ICA complex aneurysm. So this is a, just the strategies we use right now in our department that we just have the uh, angiography and we also have the BOT for 30 minutes. If the patient the patient cannot tolerate the BOT, we just have a high flow bypass. If the patient has some neurosurgical deficit, or maybe has no neurosurgical deficit, we try to see the, uh, the capillary phase on the absolute hemisphere. If the phase is delayed more than 0.5 uh, seconds, we just have a low uh, medial flow bypass. And if the, uh, the patient has uh, good uh, conditions for the uh, angiography, and we try to have the CTP to, to find the MTT, it's different or not. So we try to decide whether we have a low flow bypass or just a direct trap the ICA. <laughs> this is the, the, uh, another case, uh, example. So uh, we just, uh, just decided to, how to treat the complex MCA aneurysm. MCA aneurysm is uh, located in the uh, different part. The M1 segment is very difficult because they have a lot of perforators from the aneurysm. So at that time, we think that we try to inspect the, uh, the, the perforators and the anatomy structures during the surgery, if the, uh, uh, if the, uh, 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 if the perforators involved uh, in, the, in the dome of the aneurysm, we try to have uh, some bypass and then just to let the, uh, have, the dist uh, 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 have the proximal occlusion of the ICA or just leave it alone. If there's no uh, involvement of the uh, perforators, we just try to have a bypass and then trap the aneurysm. For the segment two, uh, M2, it's, it will be very, uh, it will be very uh, dip, uh, easy for us to do so. Do, so we have the, uh, uh, the inspection in the surgery and have the bypass and then try to inspect, uh, to, to trap the aneurysm or just to have a, a proximal occlusion of the uh, MCA. So this is will be very easy. So right now so we have a very good outcome it's over. It's almost 90 percent have the GOS more than four. 
And how about the uh, M3? M3 is a very easy case, but sometimes still we just worry about whether the, uh, we have uh, enough supply supply if we, if we just trap the aneurysm. So that's why we just have uh, 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 also have some bypass, and sometimes we just have an IC IC bypass or just you have an in situ bypass for such kind of patient. So the challenge for three is that uh, can we moderate during the surgery to, to de determine the, uh, the occlusion times or whether we have the, uh, uh, operation, uh, have the bypass. So we try to, uh, the purpose is that we try to predict the cerebral ischemia during surgery. And uh, the second one, we try to prolong the temporary occlusion of the time and also we try to decide whether we should have the direct bypass, a direct clipping, or just to have a bypass for the case. So that's why we just analyzed all the cases. We just used the MEP monitoring during the surgery, and we found that the MEP monitoring would be the very useful to identify a, a, a safe windows for the prolonged temporary occlusion. So we can prolong the uh, temporary occlusion time over uh, 20, longer than 20 minutes during the giant aneurysm uh, surgery. And also we found that the recovery of MEP after opening the ECIC bypass may indicate the patient have a good outcome. So right now we have uh, overall a good outcome is an over 90%. So the fourth one is that can we quantify the blood flow during the surgery or we try to find whether the the high flow or medium flow uh, bypass should we need during the surgery. So this is a, just, a, just a good example. So we use the NOVA technologies. We just uh, have the intraoperative MR scan during the surgery and after bypass. We can find the, uh, the, uh, the quantitative st study of the, uh, uh, of the blood flow in the, uh, in the branches. We will find that uh, within this kind of patient, we have uh, over uh, 40 millimeters, uh, millimeters per minute. Uh, blood flow means that the patient have uh, enough blood supply after the surgery. And this is just uh, some examples. And this is the giant aneurysms in the cavernous sinus. And we just uh, have a, a graft from the, uh, uh, from the arm. And we just uh, 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 to expose the MCA during the surgery. And this is just the, uh, the, uh, the protocols uh, we, uh, right now we are using. We can have uh, MCA here, and we have an ECA in the neck, and we have the bypass. This is a high flow bypass, and we just uh, uh, try to trap, trap the, uh, uh, the ICA in the neck. So this is uh, just an example for the high flow bypass of the M1 aneurysm. So for this case, we could not find any perforators on the, uh, on the dome of the aneurysm, but it's, uh, it's not possible to, 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 to have a, a stand or to have the uh, direct uh, clipping of the aneurysm. So we tried to have an ECIC bypass. And for this case, we have a very good patent of the uh, uh, bypass. This is just the, uh, the angiography after the bypass. So it will be easy for us to trap the aneurysm and have the, uh, uh, the cure and try to cure the patient. And this is also the uh, examples for the uh, bypass. This is a way called it medial flow bypass for the M1 and M2 bifurcation aneurysm. So this is an aneurysm, it's a complex aneurysm, and the, the dome is here, and the, some uh, the arteries, just the distal part is from the dome. So I decided to have, uh, 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 have a uh, clipping here to reconstruct the uh, M1 and one branch of the M2, and then try to have the bypass here to have the blood supply to this distal part. So then we can trap this aneurysm. So this is what I did uh, for this kind of aneurysm. And this is a low flow, a, me a medial flow bypass with the graft of the radio artery. And also, this is a bypass for the uh, uh, ICA MCA serpentine aneurysm. This is a very interesting case. Uh, it's uh, it's done. Uh, it, it was done in in 2003. It's a it's a serpentine aneurysm with a thrombotic inside, and this is just the uh, uh, after the bypass, and this is a before the bypass. We have the angiography showed that uh, this is an uh, 
uh, suspending aneurysm, it's not possible to remove it or try to clip it. So I just have this patient follow up for almost 13 years. And this is just the pictures show the, uh, in 2003, something like this. And then we have the bypass. At that time, so I just have an angiography and show that there's a, a no, uh, no uh, there's a no, uh, it's the absence of the uh, aneurysm, but it's unfortunately I could not find the the the, the bypass. So I, I just feel very disappointed. But it's very uh, and I just uh, check the patient every year, and in, in two years later we just found a small uh, aneurysm there, and then something like this. And in this year, the patient still is very stable and he just uh, have to be the grandmother and have some a grand, a granddaughter. So how about the, uh, the vessels? It's very interesting. You will find that uh, in 2004, when I just have a bypass, there's no patent of the, uh, uh, by, uh, the, the bypass. But it's very interesting. Two years later, so when we have the angiograph again, we will find that it's a very good patent of the vessels. So it means that sometimes it's really hard to, uh, to, to evaluate whether the patent or not for, for the bypass, and this is uh, the uh, seven years later, eight years later, and still in, in this years, there's still patent of the vessels. So it means if, we, uh, if the patient needs some blood flow, the, patent, uh, the vessels will be patent. But if it doesn't need, the, 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 uh, the vessels cannot be shown. So the, another, uh, the province for, uh, or another good candidate for the bypass is the Moya Moya disease. As the, uh, we know, the, the right now, the uh, Moya Moya disease is very common in East Asia. Uh, for example, say in Japan, in South Korea, uh, in North Korea, in South Korea, whatever, in Korea or in, in, in China. So there are so many patients suffer from the uh, Moya Moya disease. And how common of this case, uh, this patient? We will find. I just have a, 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 a survey in a small village in the in the south part of China, because the reason why I just checked the old patient, all the uh, citizens in that small city, because uh, there are so many doc, uh, so many patients that come from this village to come to see me and try to have the bypass, and I checked the all the uh, citizens in that small village. It's about 500 patients. And I asked the old citizen to have the MR scan, with, this is a TOF MRA, and try to find whether they, they have some uh, uh, additional patient. It's very interesting. Uh, I still find an additional 14 patients in these 500 patients. It means that this is some kind of uh, uh, genetic problems or, or maybe some environmental effects in this village. So I, I actually right now, so I just have the, uh, the sequence the gene sequence for all the patients, but it's, it costs a lot of money. I still got some uh, spot, have some mutations, but right now it could not have a very uh, uh, certain result from this, uh, from this res uh, 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 research. Then another one is that I just have a nationwide database uh, run by, uh, sponsored by, uh, by, uh, by me. I tried to find all the cases for the subarachnoid hemorrhage cases. In, uh, within three years, I tried to check the, in the, uh, th 10 ma uh, medical centers all the uh, uh, emergency case, and we tried to have the uh, 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 angiography for all the patients. It's very interesting that uh, there are totally 400 patients suffer from the non aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage within these uh, 2,500 patients. And it's uh, almost 35 patients is, uh, is Moya Moya disease or Moya Moya syndrome means the patient is not the, uh, from the aneurysm ruptured, not from the AVM ruptured. It's just solely because of the rupture of the, uh, the, the small vessels from the Moya Moya disease. It's account about 7% for the non-aneurysmal uh, uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage. So right now, so we think that for cerebral ischemia, it is a, uh, it is a good way to have an ECIC bias, uh, bypass introduced in 19... 67 by Dr. Yasagir, and he is the SDA, first uh, SDA MCA anastomosis. And right now, so we think that SDA MCA bypass is a good way to treat such kind of uh, cerebral ischemia. So, but whether it's uh, useful or not for the, for the hemorrhagic, uh, the Moyamo disease, 
As we know that in 2009, the New England Journal of Medicine published the, uh, the review that said that the surgery is much better than medication for the uh, ischemic myeloma disease. Because the five years follow-up, we show that the, in surgery group, there's only 2.6% of the patient still have some problems. But the, for the medications, just for the observations, there are two-thirds of the patients suffer from the deteriorations. So how about the hemorrhagic myeloma disease? Still, there have some uh, controversies for, for observations or the, for the surgery. And we just checked in, in the literature. The, uh, this is just the, from the Japan group. It just uh, analyzes the, uh, the, uh, the outcomes for the ECIC bypass for the hemorrhagic myeloma disease. And their conclusion is that the, uh, the patient who received the bypass maybe have a lower, maybe uh, a, a, a lower breathing event or have some uh, much better outcomes for the, uh, after the surgery. And this is, I just tried to analyze the all clinical data. So there are 100, over 100 patients within the three and a half a year in our department. And the patient was suffer from the hemorrhage, from the, uh, the uh, inter, uh, cerebral hemorrhage, uh, ventricle hemorrhage, or subarachnoid hemorrhage. And all this, uh, the, the clinical data show that it's, uh, most of them is a Suzuki uh, uh, phase three uh, uh, Moyama disease. And uh, I just uh, published the papers on the general of neurosurgery is about all these uh, 100 patients. And we found that uh, the breeding rate of, uh, uh, this, all, all, of this patient is about 1.8%. So you still remember that the, uh, the natural history of the patient that suffer from the rebreeding rate is over uh, 4%. So it means that the patient revascularization may provide the benefit over the conservative therapy for the ischemic uh, myeloma disease. So why the patient still can benefit from the, uh, uh, the, myeloma, uh, from the bypass? I think that uh, there are some phenomena we can explain that. So this is just the uh, examples. We just have a patient have a hemorrhagic myeloma disease, and we found that they have a distal aneurysm. And I think that maybe someone said that we can clip the aneurysm, but it's very difficult. It's the distal part. So we just have a bypass for this case. And finally, we were, when we follow up the angiography, and we show the, the, the aneurysm was disappeared during the follow-up. So it means that sometimes the, 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 the uh, hemorrhagic spots will be disappeared during, after the surgery. So the patient, why, uh, why the patient benefit from, the, uh, uh, from this bypass? And the second way is that uh, the, the dilations of the, uh, some uh, co uh, collateral uh, uh, contralateral uh, 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 circulations. So it means that the, uh, the moya moya vessels can be stronger and stronger. So this is, I think, that maybe the reasons why the patient can have some benefit from the bypass. And this is just the, uh, the uh, uh, cartoon show that uh, uh, usually I, uh, my method to, to have a, a bypass. This is, a, we call it a combined method. So we have the direct bypass with a double bypass or a single bypass. And then we just have an indirect bypass, we call the EDMS. Means that we just have an attachment with the, uh, 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 use the uh, uh, muscle to, atta to attach the, uh, the, uh, the surface of the brain and try to open the, uh, the arachnoid cyst. So, so we can have a good attachment of the uh, dura and the, the muscles after surgery. And this is uh, the, just the bypass. We just use the, uh, the uh, ICG to confirm the patent of the, the bypass. And this is just the uh, case. We have uh, the uh, uh, bypass. The after surgery, we check the uh, uh, angiography. We will find that they have uh, extensive anastomosis from the, MC, uh, 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 from the uh, meningeal artery to the uh, STA. And they have a good uh, anastomosis. And also, this is a follow-up for uh, angiography when we have their bypass. We will find that they have a very good uh, communications between the uh, extracranial uh, extra part and the intracranial part. And also, we just uh, checked the, uh, the diameters of the uh, vessels. We found that the STA was enlarged, DTA is enlarged, and MCA also enlarged. So it means that the, the patient have, a, uh, have a good enough blood supply. 
So right now, so we totally have uh, over 250 cases every year in, in, uh, in these three years. So uh, almost every year, so we have uh, more than 100 cases for the bypass because of the, uh, the uh, Moyamoy disease. So uh, we also still have to know whether we can evaluate the effectiveness of the uh, bypass. So right now, so we use the CFD. This is a computational fluid diameter analysis. And this is a good way to analyze the, uh, the changes after uh, the bypass. And we have the uh, uh, papers right now. We just, uh, uh, this is a collaborative studies with Michael Morgan from the uh, McQueen University from Australia. We have a collaborative studies to try to analyze the old hemodynamic changes after bypass. And we found that the, the flow resistance of the bypass was reduced with increased flow rate and increased uniform uh, uh, wall stress shoes. And we will find that the, uh, the resistance with, uh, within the older vessels has decreased. And also the, uh, the vessels was di uh, dilated after the bypass. And we found, also found a very interesting case, uh, interesting phenomenon, that if we have a very good shape bypass, means that the patient will have a positive remodeling uh, uh, during the follow-up. You will find that in the first, uh, on the upper one, this is just the, uh, have a, uh, the angiography, uh, the MRA, the, we just uh, show that the, uh, the shape of the bypass. And then several years later, so we just have a, a, a remodeling. And this is a really good remodeling, and the resistance in the vessels has dropped significantly. But if you have a very bad bypass, means that the shape of the bypass graft is, very, is not, so, not in a good shape, you will find that the patient still have negative remodeling, means that the, the worse, uh, the, the bad and the worse after the follow-up. So, and the, the resistance was increased. So this is also the good way to try to suggest the neurosurgeons to avoid the obvious kinky at the SDA uh, trunk. And furthermore, so we try to have a pressure to drop. Uh, we have another, uh, further the investigations that the pressure drop is a good correlation with the, uh, with the angiographic gradings. So this is just the uh, CFD model. We just used the, the, uh, the actual, the, 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 the person's uh, clinical data. And this is just some remodeling. And we just uh, 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 tried to test the, uh, the volume, uh, uh, the volume the flow rate, and also the uh, PDI after the bypass surgery. And we will find that the vessels remodeling after bypass, uh, uh, one by one. And we will find that we will have a very good composition from the contralateral side, and reduce the, 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 the resistance from the, that, that part. So we think that the pressure drop index will be good predicting factors for the assessing the treatment outcome of, for the follow-up. And also for the similar situation, we found that bilateral circulation were balanced after the, uh, the bypass. So this gave us the, uh, the very good confidence that we can st still have a further treatment. Now how about the cerebral hyperfusion, hyperfusion syndrome, which is usually happened in the uh, bypass for the Moyama disease. But this is a good uh, it's a pa patient. We just, uh, the patient has suffered from the aphasia three days after bypass. So should, should we have uh, some breathings or ischemia? We check the patient, the, uh, the uh, MRA and the CTA. Uh, find that the, uh, we try to check the MRA after the surgery. We found that no neurosurgical death, uh, no, no any kind of breathings. But the patient, we, just, uh, we have uh, some uh, treatment. Then the patient have no neurological deficit after treatment. So it means that we try to test or try to evaluate the perfusions on the MR scan and try to confirm whether the patient have the high perfusion. So this is the method that we used the MR to, to, to analyze the high perfusion and for, they use the intraoperative MR. And we found that the, uh, during the surgery, we can find some high perfusions for some several cases. And these cases may be just uh, correlated. They think, uh, the greetings can, uh, can correlate it with the, uh, the, the findings of, uh, EF, uh, on the MR scan. So we, right now, so we have the uh, uh, treatment uh, just the, after the bypass. We just uh, use some uh, to try to control the hypertension and try to control the cerebral edema and try to use the anti epileptic dr uh, drugs to control the, uh, the, epilepsy, uh, the epilepsy. So 
this is a similar way to use the NOVA to evaluate the, uh, the blood volumes after the bypass. So this is the uh, case. We show that after bypass, we can have the uh, uh, increase in the, uh, in, the, in the graft. This is some examples. So how about the, uh, the, the bypass? Is, is bypass can, uh, can improve the co cognitive functions of the patient? Because we, as we know, the old, a lot of patients that suffer from the cerebral ischemia may have some problems about the cognitive status. So we just use the functional network study, try to find the, uh, the, is there any effective or not for the bypass. So this is just a new starting to, to use the functional MR to evaluate the cognitive status. And this is that we just have several uh, results, and we just confirm that the bypass can improve the cognitive status for the Moyama disease after the bypass. Uh, it's it's, a, it's a, little, a little complicated, and we just published papers in the Journal of Neurosurgery showing that the positive correlations between the postoperative perfusion improvement and the surgical revascularization. So, in summary, the vessel removing or STA MCA bypass can usually reduce the flow resistance, and the, the vessel removing after bypass is associated with, with the reduction of the blood flow rate and pressure drop, and also intraoperative uh, perfusion is, can be useful to, to, to evaluate the, the high perfusion after the surgery, and also NOVA technology is useful. And also we just try uh, to start to use the resting state of functional MR to detect whether we can uh, to improve the uh, cognitive status of the patient after cerebral ischemia. So how about the future for, the, uh, for such kind of disease, uh, uh, the research uh, and the clinical work? We think that we need the prospective cohort and randomized clinical trial for the further to, to define the best evidence-based practice. And also hemodynamic, uh, hemodynamic assessment and the cognitive function and the quality of life should be assess, uh, assessed both before and after the surgery. And so right now, so we try to have a continued research work for uh, continuing the clinical research work. So right now, so we just uh, uh, registered for the, uh, uh, the clinicaltrial.gov uh, to have uh, some uh, clinical study about the adult hemorrhagic Moyama disease study. And also right now, so we just train the old young resident in our department, try to learn the bypass techniques. So this is just a picture show that we train the older resident in our department. So usually every year we have more than 10 new residents just come to our department to learn. So totally right now we have 40 new residents in our department. As introduced by Dr. Nanda, we just have a very, very good meetings, some meetings in our department and we just try to offer the good training systems for the young neurosurgeons. Uh, in, uh, for the domestic neurosurgeons uh, or from the international neurosurgeons. So we just uh, trained a lot of neurosurgeons from Indonesia, from Bangladesh, and some uh, uh, re researchers from the, uh, uh, Italy and from Switzerland. So I, I would like to thank you for all the, uh, uh, the, the residents who helped me to prepare such kind of uh, clinical data and try to help, uh, the thank you for the McQueen University Dr. Uh, Michael Morgan for the cooperative studies on the CFD. And thank you for your attention. It's time for a quick question. I have any questions. These are my best. Go ahead. I was wondering for your Moya Moya, what percentage of your uh, bypass are interact, uh, what, what percentage of your wax? And for the wax, what's your patency rate after the uh, bypass? You mean for the unilateral or uh, the, for the bypass rate, the, the patency rate? Right. Right now, so we, we just published papers in, uh, two years ago in the Journal of Neurosurgery. At that time, so the patency just after the bypass is 100%. But still, it's uh, 90% when we just have a follow up for six months later. We usually have a check here, the angiography, maybe six months later. So, still, it's very hard. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
you always do to web bypass people more and more? Uh, and if, uh, for the age, uh, for the over, uh, young, uh, older age than six years old, we just prefer have the direct bypass. But uh, for the pediatric patient, we just have uh, indirect bypass. Thank you very much. What I did tell you about him, he's really Chairman Mao's grandson. I didn't want to tell that before, <laughs> but I always tease him about that. Uh, I think it's wonderful for everybody to realize that you know China as an academic giant is awakening. I mean, we review a lot of the papers coming out of China now, and it's a superb publications, great science, and I thank you for sharing that with us. Our next speaker is Franco Cervadea, who uh, is really a global giant in trauma. He went to the medical school at University of Bologna and is now running the trauma unit at the University of Parma. Uh, he's been president of the Italian Neurosurgical Society and has really done groundbreaking work in trauma. He's on the Global Advisory Board for Neuro and Trauma. He's set up teaching standards globally for trauma. And uh, both in this country, in Europe, and in Asia, he's really respected for the guidelines on trauma management. Uh, he's published extensively, has a very IH index, he's published in trauma and other factors, and uh, he really is a global, global, you know, giant in trauma. Not only that, he's done a lot for organized neurosurgery, he's been president of the Italian Neurosurgical Society, and uh, the, you know, the World Federation was sort of run like a banana republic historically, and uh, with the help of American prodding and global support, he sort of brought an Arab Spring into World Federation and became the president-elect. So he's now going to be running the World Federation of Neurosurgery. So we're very fortunate. He's leaving for Japan, I think, in 48 hours. He has a real globe-trotting schedule. So we're very fortunate he took time out of his busy schedule to be with us. Without much further ado, Dr. Professor Franco Cervantes. Daniel, uh, also for the picture of the cheese, and Giuseppe Verdi, the opera, is from Parma, born in Parma. Uh, well, when we talk about, uh, I have also my thanks to the faculty here, to Anil. When uh, I was running for the World Federation at the beginning, I was a bit uh, depressed, and uh, everybody was telling me that it's like uh, claiming a mountain without being trained, so you go nowhere. You go up and then you stop. And uh, a long discussion with Anil and uh, Edgardo, who is here, and many other friends convinced me to keep running, and it was a good uh, running. So I have to thank, in public, Anil for the help he gave me. Uh, we talk about trauma, we have to talk about history. There are a lot of young uh, students here, and what I found is a limit of the American education is the lack of studying history. We do too much in Europe, but you do probably not enough. History is like a circle. Things are coming in medicine, going away, and coming back. When they come back, we don't have the memory of what happened before. And this is wrong, because usually what happened before is going to happen again. And I will show you the story of decompression, which is a typical story of, going, of things going in circles. Uh, we know that the, the, the first neurosurgical disease to be described is brain injury, which was found in the so-called Edwin Smith papyrus, not because Edwin Smith wrote it, because uh, Edwin Smith found it in, in, uh, in Egypt. And the papyrus is 3,000 years old. In these papyrus, there are 48 cases. Out of them, 42 also concerned head injury. So it was a, an important disease at that time, obviously because you could see it. And six cases also dealt with spine trauma. In the Maya culture, we have a lot of treffing, a lot of drillings. Both, you see on the left, the post-mortem, or on the right, done in vivo, and the patient survived. You look at the arrangement of the bone around the drill. So, but we have no follow-up. We don't know what happened. They were drilling, and then the patient died. We don't know. Uh, Hippocrates, who was uh, the chief of everyone who is here, the big doctors in the history, 
he founded the, the modern medicine from Greece, he said uh, something which is still true now, no head injury is too trivial to ignore or not too serious to despair of. We're still there. We, we cannot ignore head injury, but we are confident that we can cure most of them. Uh, the Romans uh, went back. Unfortunately, I, I'm Italian, so I would say, love to tell you that the Roman doctors were very good. It's not true. <laughs> uh, the, the doctors of the Roman army were bad. The, the main concern was in Romans, in Latin, is called pietas. You know what I understand. Respect the suffering of the patient. And if the suffering is too much, kill them. That was uh, very easy. Avoiding sufferance uh, by eliminating the problem. Uh, but there was one big doctor, only one, two, a couple of them. One was these guys called Aulus Aurelius Cornelius Celsius, which was uh, at the time of the Augustus emperor. And he wrote a book about medicine, and he was reporting the first post-traumatic symptoms. He became famous uh, in outside Italy because these guys in Oxford, I think it's here, discovered, I mean, the National Institute of Clinical Excellence in United Kingdom spent three million pounds to publish guidelines for the management of mild head injuries. And these guys discovered that they were published 2,000 years before by Celsius. So they said you spent three million pounds, but if you translate this from Latin, it was the same because the, the guidelines were very similar. So in the past, already we had symptoms which were very much worrying after a head injury, like vomiting, like obscure visions, like vertigo. They were already identified. Then, uh, I mean, in the Italian Renaissance, we had a lot of surgeons dealing with that injury, especially one of them, Berengarius, who is here. And uh, this is a paper from Anil, who was published in World Neurosurgery. But this guy, Berengario, it's a guy who described the surgical indication in brain injuries. This you can translate in <coughs> 1535 after Christus, was published in Venice. So in the Middle Ages, in the Renaissance period. And he described the instrument you have to use to operate a fracture, depressed fracture in the brain, and also the surgical indication. But the most interesting part, we found a letter in Bologna uh, by, uh, library that he wrote to Cardinal Jacopo Volpi, surgery as a price, and surgeon with experience in penetrating traumatic brain injury are rare. I am one of that, he said. Therefore, you must be prepared to pay for surgery. 150 golden crores. So this is one of the first time in which we identified the charge of an expert surgeon. It, it took us, uh, to my colleague in Venice, about 10 years to understand how much is this. And they found that at that time, you could buy a small flat, a small house with this. <laughs> so the, the cost of a surgeon, the cost of an important surgeon was very high. It, it, we don't know if then he treated this patient or not. We only know that the, his charge was this. And what? What about the, uh, is important trauma surgery for neurosurgeon? In our unit, 34% of the procedure are brain and spine injury, but we are a level one. In Japan, we have the data for all the surgery done in 2014, 250,000 surgery all over Japan, and 53,000, 22% are trauma surgeries. So it's about one patient in four. In Indonesia, it's about the same, one patient in four. In Rwanda, in Africa, it's 37%. So trauma surgery is important. And also in America, this is another paper from this university talking about the, the incidence and cost of epidural hematoma, which is the typical post-traumatic lesion. Then we have a 
three slides about the history of decompression, which is now the most important uh, surgical approach to trauma. Uh, also, we need to study history. In 85, 2005, uh, Susan Oki, uh, <coughs> now the surgeon, published this paper about the first Iraqi war. And they say we are saving the life of our soldier after a blast injury with the new procedure. This is the new procedure. Unfortunately, this procedure was already published in 1896 in Paris. This guy published a thesis of doctorate, which is very actual, saying we can temporary, temporary means uh, for a while, take off part of the bone to diminish the pressure in the, bone, in, the, in the skull, and then we can put it back which was already at the, begin at the end of uh, uh, the 19th century. So, but the man who published uh, uh, quite a lot description of uh, how to decrease intracranial pressure by taking off the bone is Alfred A. Theodor Kosher, who is a Swiss surgeon working in Germany. We described also how, do we, how you can do it. Do we have guidelines for surgery? We go now to to the times in which we are now, uh, yes, we have. These are the guidelines which were published for the management of traumatic brain injury. I was the only one from non-US to publish uh, these guidelines in 2006. They have been accepted by the community. But we now have a problem that we did not consider when we published the guidelines. Guidelines are evidence-based. By definition, evidence base should be the same all over the world. Is it possible that we apply the same guidelines all over the world? Which are the different situations that we are facing? Are the resources important? This is my unit, ICU, that's Parma. You have uh, one nurse for each patient. You have a lot of monitorings. We consider when these beds are full, and when we have less than one nurse per patient, we tell that we are full. This is Indonesia, Surabaya. Look, this is the different concept of full. Half of these patients do not have monitoring. They are overwhelmed. But most of you, there are medical students here, I, I guess. It, this is the left side of uh, Surabaya. This is right side, medical student ventilating by hands because they don't have enough ventilators. Medical student changing, shifting every hour. The medical student is ventilating by hand. By another hour, another one is coming. So this is a situation in a country is not with, with very, very limited facility. Indonesia is something in between. This is Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam. And these are patient treated in the ICU, 40 admission and 10 operations per day. And they try to keep the people alive. This is Rwanda, Africa, sub-Saharan Africa, very similar situation. Three neurosurgeons all over the country, one neurosurgeon for four million people. Very typical sub-Saharan. Sub-Saharan area is this one. This is North Africa. North Africa is totally different. So, I believe we were wrong. We cannot think that in Parma and in these countries we can do the same. If we try to convince people that the guidelines are the same, we do as we did before. Either everything or nothing. So it means nothing. Very simple. We don't want the word nothing. If we want to have a worldwide perspective, we need to have priorities. And we need to tell the people what they have to do. You know, this is uh, what we use, you use. I mean, you can have a transfer of images, you can have WhatsApp, you can have whatever you want. But you have to cure the patient that you can cure in this area. The big bias is not only in neurosurgery, only in trauma. I think it's everywhere. The, we have a look, uh, one of my residents has done a, a thesis on that, uh, which we are, is now on publication. 
89% of the papers on traumatic brain injury come from US, Canada, Australia, Japan, and Europe. In these countries, there is less than 80% of the injuries all over the world. So we tell 80% of trauma, how do we, we tell the people how do we cure a small minority of patients. And we tell them how to do it in conditions which are different. Obviously, why the trauma are not in Europe? This is uh, India. They are happy. Look, they are very happy, but they are not protected. If they crash, it's, it's a mess, <laughs> even if they are happy. So uh, I, I guess that this, if we move to the last part uh, of the exp uh, exposition of my paper, Presentation, it's uh, which patient should be operated after trauma. This is the paper that the European Consortium published in uh, 2005, which is still uh, also with some input from America, Dominique Esposito from US, and the other one is a multi-center study in Europe. What did we say? That when the surgeon decides to operate, he decides on the basis of radiological clinical and physiological parameters. How big is the lesion? How is uh, shifting the midline? Which is the age of the patient? Which is the clinical condition? Which is the intracranial pressure? The surgeon takes into account all of these parameters. If we operate when the patient arrives to the hospital in the night, a trauma usually is because the lesion is causing a big mass effect, like this, who is not going to operate this patient. Everyone will do it. Or small lesion but big midline shift, meaning the lesion is small but is causing a compression on the brain. Or this is a contusion also causing shift and compression. So this is easy decision. We will take it out, no problem. But the lesion can evolve. You know, if we don't operate immediately and we put the patient in ICU, then we have three possibilities. The patient is improving or, or worsening. The patient has a radiological deterioration or not. The patient has an increased ICP or not. These three factors go together. This is a simple case. A patient with a, <coughs> a frontal sinus breakthrough fracture, a small contusion on arrival, ICP monitoring, blood pre <coughs> ICP, uh, cerebral perfusion pressure down, intracranial pressure up, repeat CT scan, big hematoma operations. Because uh, the evolution of the CT scan is the same as the evolution of the intracranial pressure. So the decision is easy. But Life is not so easy. You see it here. This is a study that we published on 350 cases of contusions. Very often, the patient has a radiological deterioration, 60%, but only 30%, half of them, have a clinical deterioration. So very often, we don't know how to manage this patient because the CT scan is worse, but the <coughs> clinical condition probably stable. And uh, what we found in this paper is that uh, the midline shift increased and the basal system compression are very important to decide whether or not to operate. When to use uh, decompression, this is a very hot topic. Uh, last week we, it was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, a paper that we have written, I mean, basically, our friend from Cambridge, together with a group of Europeans, uh, including me, have written about the use of intracranial decompression for uh, decreasing intracranial pressure, which is the effect of decompression. When we take off the bone, the intracranial pressure goes down, cerebral perfusion pressure increased, very good, but also this. This is, means uh, I show you with colors, it's easy. In the part of the brain that is decompressed, we lose autoregulation, and we have an increase of cerebral blood flow, which not always is favorable for the patient. So we have positive effects, but on the 
brain circulation on cerebral blood flow, not always the increase is a positive effect. Just to summarize, we have decompression for traumatic brain injury. We call it secondary decompression. You need ICP monitoring here, and you decide whether or not to decompress the patient. There are two studies, the DECRA study, the rescue ICP study, which has been published last week. And that the primary decompression is different, is the patient that you operate on arrival without ICP monitoring. This is a typical case of uh, secondary decompression. ICP goes up after six days after injury. And uh, the, we did a perfusion CT scan, no perfusion in both frontal lobes, so we don't lose anything and we decompress the patient with a good result. That's typical case of secondary decompression. This is the DECRA study with the Australian study, which was published in 2011 in the New England Journal of Medicine. And this study is telling us that after, when the patient has more than 20 of intracranial pressure for more than 15 minutes, is randomized to decompression or standard of care. Most part of the world, these patients are not decompressed. Why? Because only 50 minutes over 20 is a really short time. We can try for more time to cure the patient. And another problem with this study, they have studied 3,500 patients almost, that they have randomized only 155. So it means that this population is really uncommon, not common. Which are the results in one minute? This is intracranial pressure. The pressure goes down after ICP control, perfect ICP control, but the outcome is worse. The outcome of patient decompress is worse. And especially the main concern is here, the number of patients in vegetative state increase a lot and also the number of patients with severe disability. We will see it later also. So this paper was not very well received brackets because it really was rejected. We had uh, this paper generated six contra-editorials, four clinical paper with the same data re-elaborated for the second time. I don't know how you can publish. You are a reviewer for how can you publish a contra, a contra paper, a paper with the data of one paper elaborated by someone else. But 38 letters. The Australian authors of the DECRA have been interrupted during the presentation of the study one year in US at the WNS, interrupted where they were presenting the study. Just to say that this study uh, generated a very strong reaction. And the only one letter I have to congratulate with Dan Marion because he was the only one to write in favor of this paper. Then we had the, the publication last week of this trial. Uh, this, the group of Cambridge is here, Peter Atkinson, Angelo Scolia, Isaac Timofev, uh, this group, and together with the group of the European Juan Saquillo is from Spain, Andrea Sunterberg is from Germany, that's me, and Grant is the, you all know, it's the GGS, the inventor of the GGS scale. And this study is decompressive caniotomy can improve as last year therapy for refractory intracranial hypertension. These are the university which contributed together with the European Consortium, is a multi-center European study. This is the inclusion rate in the different uh, centers. 70% of the patients are from UK. So we have a quite homogeneous group of patients. Uh, and uh, the first country to include patients outside US was Italy with two cases here and South America with more cases there. So the operation was uh, the patient was randomized when the ICP was more than 25, non, not 20, for 1 to 12 hours, not 15 minutes. So it means that the patient were much better, much better identified. 
And this is the, I, I escape it, this is the flow chart. If the patient has more than 25, then you have to do all medical maneuvers that you can. If the pressure doesn't go down, then you randomize the patient to barbiturates or surgery. There were the, both uh, techniques were accepted, unilateral decompression or bifrontal, the one you have seen before. And, uh, but uh, the most important, one of the most important thing is that, uh, you know, over 2,000 patients were screened, but 400 were included, very much different from the DECRA. One patient in five was included in the study. It means that these patients are very common. And the characteristic of the two groups were similar. The only problem was that in the medical group, 37% uh, of patients had a crossover, what means uh, that they were not uh, operated because they were randomized to barbiturates, but the barbiturates could not control ICP, so the patient, were, in spite of the randomization, were crossed to the other side, operated. This is uh, the scale to evaluate uh, the eight-point Glasgow outcome scale with, to evaluate the outcomes. And uh, this is the very, you have to think about it when you see this data. Look, the mortality is very much reduced by the number of patients in vegetative state is four times more. And the number of patients in severe disability, not independent, is two times more. So the price you pay is there. Well, but, so there is no difference, uh, green is good outcomes. After six months, the percentage of good outcome is the same in the two groups. Only you have a redistribution of bad results. Less mortality, more vegetative and severe disability. After 12 months, the situation is different. I go directly to this slide, you understand it better. The number after six months, meaning other six months of rehabilitation, the patient move and the number of patients with good, disability, good outcome in the surgical group is better. So what does it mean? That it's very much important to work intensively with this patient, as they have done in UK. But what about a country where you don't have rehabilitation or the access to post-acute care is non-existing? This is a nice study which was published this year comparing Two situations, one in US, Seattle, Harbor View Medical Center, and one in India, all, 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 all India Medical Institute. They both were following the guidelines, so they both were in the same acute situation. These are the results. In Seattle, the mortality was 26%. But it was 26% as the charge of the patient and after 12 months, the same, only one new death. With rehabilitation, cure of the patient, uh, nurses at home, physiotherapy, this is the result. In India, without, almost without the follow-up, 24% as the charge, 29, 3 months, 34, 6 months, 36, 12 months. What does it mean? That the result that I showed you are typical of a country in which you can cure the patient after the first month. If you don't have that part, I am afraid that this result will not be the same because a part of mortality will arrive later, will not stay there. So I, I uh, that's primary decompression is a different story. This is a patient with an acute subdural hematoma or an acute huge contusion operated and decompressed. So primary decompression is because of the lesion, not because of the intracranial pressure who is not there. And uh, for primary decompression, there is now an international study. This is another, again, a collaboration between the University of Cambridge, six more universities, three in UK, one in Canada, one in 
<laughs> in uh, US and one in Italy, with this, uh, the founding members of this collaboration and the study. The research is, should we take off the hematoma plus a decompression, or should we only take off the hematoma? And this is the big problem is 900 patients. We need 900 patients to show efficacy of that study, and 900 patients in Europe is really difficult. Uh, you need a lot of years. So these are the, if I give you the possibility, if there is an interest to collaborate, because already the, fi the only five international patients included in the study are coming from Texas, from U.S. And to finish, uh, ethics of what we do. This is a very thoughtful comment from Shirley Timmons uh, about the paper that you have seen. The rescue ICP showed that decompressive surgery in patients with traumatic brain injury and raised intracranial pressure was associated with lower mortality. However, more survivors in the surgical group rather than in the medical group were dependent on others. A finding that emphasizes the fact that life-saving procedure may not ensure a return to normal functioning. This is utmost important. In particular, the larger proportion of vegetative state in the surgical group than in the medical group is not worth it. We, we need to know where we are. This is a huge hematoma. In a patient age 74 with a Glasgow 4, I this is a case which was sent us by telemedicine at one hour driving up from our hospital. I was in a course and I asked the neurosurgeon, will you accept this patient? And the majority say yes. And again, the majority say yes, we will operate and decompress this patient, which will be the results. Or this patient, this is a case of ourselves. The resident in duty felt that 15 years uh, is not, not enough to decide not to do anything. Is a Glasgow 3 on the scene, but uh, some reacting poop is on arrival. You have a brainstem hemorrhage, a huge devastating contusion. The patient was decompressed, and this is after six years. Persistent vegetative states and a lot of cure. And you remember that in 79, when I tell you the story, in 79, Paul Cooper in New York wrote, surgery for traumatic brain injury cannot cure unsalvageable patient, providing them a reasonable quality of life in 79. This patient was decompressed three times. So in conclusion, surgical indication in TBI are easy, either easy or very difficult. There is nothing in between. We have to be prepared to discuss a case for a long time before to decide. When in doubt, we have to look at the compression of the hematoma. So basal system and midline shift are the most important uh, driving forces for surgery. We obviously need local guidelines, so we need to adapt the guidelines we have on evidence-based medicine to the resources we have in a special and the decision about decompression, second-tier treatment, must take into account important ethical issues. The neurosurgeon have to do it in close collaboration with intensivists, because in our countries, the intensivists are in the ICU, and mostly important with the families. We need to inform the families where we are going. This is mostly important. We cannot do only a surgical procedure because we have to solve a problem after an hour. We will create probably a problem for years to come. We need to inform the families and discuss the possibilities that we have. We need class one studies. We only have published two studies. We need more studies. And we need studies from the countries where they have the trauma. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor. That was an excellent talk. I think, you know, uh, in Shreveport, our whole community is facing a lot of issues in terms of medical care, control, who's going to control the hospitals. And I think you, you should take a moment and realize how blessed we are that people get taken care of. You know, a lot of these institutions, and I've been to the Alden Institute, a couple of the other places, the resident, the second-year resident is the deciding god. So there's 
four sub-bureaus, you have one operating room, you have to pick one out of the four. So this is a PGY one or two, <coughs> making life and death decisions. Uh, and it's a hard thing to do. So I think, and, and, I, and I want to echo your, com your comments. I had a patient come in who told me that about 20 years ago, her son had a bad head injury, and I advised against being aggressive. And she came back 20 years later and said, you know, my son survived, but for 10 years he was vegetative. And if I had to do it all over again, I wouldn't do that. So I think it's, it's a wonderful note of caution that you bring in, that we shouldn't just say, oh, you need an operation. Sometimes we have to look at the whole thing and look at the family and stuff. Any questions? Uh, we were raised in the, the rest before, for a time, and the, the conclusion from the, the, the second hypothesis, not the patient who arrived and we made the surgery immediately and the compression in many cases, but those patients that in the, the medical treatment failed, and the results and the vegetative uh, status is so high, and maybe we can uh, say that as well. Uh, the number of patients who survive without surgery is, is less, but in better condition. What is your personal opinion? My, uh, what, uh, you know, <laughs> I tell you one second. You know the New England Journal of Medicine. Right. <laughs> you all know it. We all dream of publishing in the but they have rules. We, we say that we wanted to publish a positive message. We wanted to include a group of patients, young patients, Glasgow over five, deteriorating. These are the patients you can save and good quality of life with decompression. But it was not pre-specified. They did not accept, you know. So, but there is, we are going to publish a consensus conference where we will identify patients in which it works, and we will identify patients over 65 years, uh, comma, below five where it doesn't work. But we couldn't do it in the New England Journal. That's why. Thank you. So from China, we went to Europe, and now we're going to South America. For those of you who have jet lag, there's going to be coffee after all this. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Edgardo Spagnolo, who's really a worldwide figure in neurosurgery. He's from Montevideo, in Uruguay. He went to medical school there and trained there and rose up the ranks to become professor and run the Department of Neurosurgery. He's become a leader in global neurosurgery. He's president of the Latin American Neurosurgical Society, Planck. He's worked with the AANS and CNS on that. He's the president of the Uruguay Neurosurgical Society, uh, really a master surgeon and uh, you know, I, I don't want to sound, we're just bringing the best here, but he is easily one of the best neurosurgeons in Uruguay and in South America. So we're very fortunate your time out of his busy schedule to come to be with us here today. So without much further ado, Professor Spanier. Well, good morning. Uh, thank you, Professor Nanda. Good, good morning. And thank to all the staff. Um, I'm so glad to be here with you this year and with all these the young people. Uh, I'm going to continue uh, and I'm going to talk about an, an illness that uh, you can say oh, most about uh, hemorrhage, most about uh, endovascular treatment, most about surgical treatment. I am not uh, to go in this way for this uh, conference. I'm going to talk about the, the diagnosis of the cerebral hemorrhage because we, we lost most of the patient for bad diagnosis, not for the treatment. There's, there is there are something new in cerebral hemorrhage in the, in the last years. Well, um, ah, okay. Uh, in the last 25 years, we were talking and writing about uh, the best treatment for aneurysms. Conventional surgery, endovascular surgery, a lot of publication about that, a lot of controversial about that. But what happened with the prognosis if the diagnosis is not correct and the patient, and the patient arrived to the hospital after two, three, or four bleedings? If we see the, the, the bibliography in the last year, 
you can see that the, the mortality and the mor morbidity will reduce in the uh, cerebral aneurysm. But this is not uh, uh, also bad for the uh, surrounding hemorrhage. It was because there is a lot of the diagnosis of unwrapped aneurysm. And the prognosis of the surgery of this aneurysm is better, much better, than the patient who suffer an aneurysm. Uh, you can see here the mortality of aneurysm and rotten aneurysm is 0 to 1%, and the morbidity 5 to 10%. It's totally different to a patient who suffered the hemorrhage. For that, the diagnosis of an unrupted aneurysm is very important. And if you see, and this aneurysm is plus treatment. We don't accept that a patient with an unrupted aneurysm is treated conservatively. It must treat the aneurysm. I don't, it's the main for me, is the, the patient or the physician decide to do endovascular or conventional surgery. For me, the most important in this analysis is to treat them. But on the other hand, and that's the most important of my conference, is the misdiagnosis, the false diagnosis in surrounding hemorrhage. I think this is one of the most uh, important points in the bad prognosis <coughs> after uh, the hemorrhage. There is a lot of paper about that, but don't, we, don't, we don't read it because we don't want to read about surgery or on different kind of surgery or on the different kind of, uh, of treatment. The first time I read an article about that was in, in 1987. This Walter from Germany uh, wrote a paper about misdiagnosis and the, 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 the percentage uh, um, prognosis. I was surprised when I, I saw the uh, number, the percentage of misdiagnosis of surrounding hemorrhage. 20 to 40 percent of the patients are not diagnostic in the first time. When I saw that, they, I said, but how bad there is the situation in Germany? <laughs> because we are neurosurgeons, we receive the patient with the diagnosis, we treat them. Sometimes we said, well, the patient uh, the outcome was not good because he arrived later, he, was, he arrived with a spas, he arrived after one or two uh, bleedings. But we don't, we don't uh, ask how was the, the, the history of these patients. For that, uh, we repeat the same, way, the same paper with the same uh, order that uh, Walter uh, did in 1987 in my country. The first time was in 1988. Uh, Bichard was one, one of the most recent in, in the year. Now he's a, a, a brilliant neurosurgeon. He uh, worked in, in tumor. And the, the name, the title of the, uh, in Spanish, Error Diagnosticos, False Diagnosis, Misdiagnosis in Hemorrhage. We published uh, it in a local, local uh, journal. Um, after that, yeah, because we have a very awful result of the study, we repeat the, repeat the study, uh, study six years later in 2004 with other uh, now neurosurgeon and excellent background neurosurgeon, Dr. Daniel Wilson. Uh, we publish it uh, in another uh, local journal. And again, the results were so bad. For, so again, you can find the misdiagnosis, the final percentage. Uh, Walter, 1987, 35%. In our first paper, 44% of the patient, and in the second paper, 40%. Now, last year, we review all the uh, 2015 patients who arrived who, uh, with an cerebral hemorrhage. Now we are finishing the, the statistics uh, study, but the results continue go, uh, being so high, 40% uh, of misdiagnosis continue at this moment uh, uh, in my country. Where is the problem? Where is the problem? Uh, for that, it's so important that uh, we have here a lot of young people, because we must teach uh, to young people, and not only to the students, to the uh, doctors. And we found where was the level of the first diagnosis. The first level and the, the, the high percentage first in the family doctors. After that, in peripheral uh, hospital, first level hospitals, emergency doctors 
when I told emergency doctors, I told about uh, uh, the emergency of the hospital or the emergency who came to the home or the, of the patient. After that, we can found false diagnosis in, in places where we think it's impossible that happened. Third level hospital with neurosurgeon and a specialist in the, in the emergency room, neurologist, and also <coughs> in the result of the imaging. Sometimes the patient uh, talks to a, a family doctor who thinks he's in a coronary hemorrhage. He asks for a CT scan, and the CT scan said it's normal. The family doctor, they, they don't have the, 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 to know how to read the, the CT scan. He only read the, the paper who sent the neurologist. Um, in our, in our uh, two papers, uh, the percentage of times of consultations was similar. Two times, 60%, three times, 55%, and patient, 15% patients who were four times to the doctor or to the hospital, and at the end, uh, they uh, are uh, maybe diagnosed. You can imagine how many times Pass from the moment of the first hemorrhage to the different to the final point when they are diagnosed. The sometimes it happens two days, three days, but sometimes it happens one week, two weeks. And this is very awful. Because it's a big influence of the misdiagnosis in their town. As well as Walter's paper and our publication, the false diagnosis increased the bleeding, increased the vasos pass increase the morbidity and increase the morbidity, the mortality. In our two papers, the morbidity and mortality was 30% worse in patients with the late surgery compared with patients with early or ultra early surgery. And when I put surgery here, I'm talking about the both, the both possibilities, so classical surgery or endovascular surgery. How, to how we can do to change this uh, very bad misdiagnosis. This is our work. It's very important to teach from the school's medicine to the students, but also <coughs> to teach to uh, the colleagues. We must educate at all the levels, the students' medicine, medical doctors of first care level, who, are, who uh, receive most of these patients, medical doctors, emergency rooms, I don't know all emergencies, and obviously at the hospital. It's important, the permanent teaching. But we are doing that after the first paper. And the percentage at the moment continue being uh, so high. It's, it's very important, it's, it's our responsibility, that uh, a CT scan with a clear hemorrhage said normal. That is a, a, it's impossible to accept. We must teach the, uh, the imagine departments of the hospital, must re teach the residents all to how to recognize the bleed in a CT scan. Uh, why all of this? Because the aneurysms after a swallowing hemorrhage must be treated as soon as possible. Array treatment is demonstrated changes dramatically the percentage of mortality and morbidity in the last 30 years. How to, how to treat? Well, I am not going to enter into the discussion. I am a conventional surgeon, but uh, after that, all of you know, the, the world changed to endovascular. Now it changing, it began to change again, and now we are uh, working uh, to try that our residents who like vascular surgery, uh, they are training in both possibilities, endovascular and classical surgery, and the, be the neurosurgeon who decide and who treat the patient in a different form as he thinks is a better form for each patient. But it's a time in, in the scan. The patient arrives to the emergency room, immediately to the imaging department, that is not necessary to weigh nothing, fitted care unit, and surgery. That is a, a, a very simple timing. And the emergency room, independent of the grade, imagine as soon as possible. Now we can do 
uh, CT with action CT and 3D reconstruction. This may avoid the necessary to do an angiography. All of us know that the CT with the CT uh, 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 angio CT and 3D is a very good uh, study and we did uh, most of our searches now with CT, angio CT and only a few times with angiography. This uh, we uh, reduce the time before the re we receive the patient and the patient I finally treat. Is the ancient CT, when CT is enough? Yes, in the last 10 years, the work of radiologists and the new scanners let obtain excellent actual CT, sometimes better than angiography. If the ancient CT is good, obviously it's enough to do the surgery. But if the ancient CT is not good because it's not a good uh, study, we need an angiography. We need to know the, the uh, anatomy, the relation of the aneurysms. MRI only in case we are arrived late at the hospital and the CT uh, was negative, when we have to know if we were a bleeding, we, may, we perform an MRI, and obviously with this we perform an angio MRI. But uh, most of the cases we don't do that. We uh, make the surgery, uh, we treat the patient with the uh, angio CT. This is a typical angio CT, we say the reconstruction without bone and with bone to, uh, to see the relations uh, for preparing for the patient for the treatment, in this case for a classical neurosurgery, or uh, in other cases the patient was studied with a an, uh, an classical angiogram, but after that to the, the, the control to know if it was uh, the clip is, got, uh, is in good form, we made an angio CT from, uh, as form of control. For that we use the uh, angio CT for the diagnosis and also to control the patient after the treatment. Uh, surgery or endovascular surgery <coughs> doesn't matter. The most important is the early treatment. Better less than 12 hours after the patient arrives. No delay surgery. Why? Because if we wait, we can have that. Bleeding with the hematomas and all of us know that the bleeding has a high mortality and a high morbidity. Uh, when we perform delayed surgery? Well, when the patient arrives uh, very late after the surgery uh, with an uh, ischemic lesion in disease scans, we discuss uh, this case with the, our endovascular. Uh, if, uh, if it's possible to, to do the endovascular uh, without uh, improve the, the bad results. Uh, in this case, uh, we wait sometimes. Bibliography is not clear about the results in, in those cases. Personally, I discuss each case with the rest of the team, clinical condition, other pathologies, age, uh, the anatomy of the anatomy and the anatomy is very important to the decision of the opportunity of the surgery in those patients who arrive later and that patient most of them are because they are missed the diagnosis and the first time. Um, it was very important in the last year the lumbar drainage. It changed dramatically the, the hydrocephalus and the second illness um, in these patients. The lumbar drainage in, in all patients, uh, we have better recovery, less vascularity <coughs> and less delayed uh, hydrocephalus. Uh, we did it in 100% of the cases. Uh, we put the lumbar drainage and we maintain it from three to seven days, depending on the, the clinical condition of the patient and depending on the, 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 the blood in the... In the, in the, the uh, after that, uh, the patient continue because the, the all of this not end at the surgery. The critical unit uh, is very important, the treatment there, uh, we know here in America uh, most of the critical care unit are uh, work the, the resident uh, with sometimes with a specialist uh, physician but uh, it's important and there is a lot of treatment uh, uh, a lot of trial about uh, nimodipine, magnesium, uh, nicardipine, uh, intraarterial uh, and other 
are treatments to avoid or try to avoid the complication after the session, and most important that is the, the vasospan. Uh, I think the maintain the, the good condition, the good clinical condition, high pleasure, uh, and, and good stabilization of the patient, uh, you have the, the, the best results. And the critical unit before the surgery, this, this hours, a few hours, in the good place, just uh, analgesic sedation, nimodipine. Uh, the question is if we use antipiletic or antifibrinolytic or not. There is a bibliography uh, who, who are going to, it's better or not to use the end. Uh, personally, I don't use the end, but there is a paper who uh, uh, talks about the benefit of use of uh, the end. The patient will purgate uh, before surgery. Obviously, we must uh, try to stabilize those patients. Um, here is always the, the, the difference is, is if you do the surgery or not in this patient because most of the day has bad uh, prognosis. It will depends. In, in this case, we wait sometimes for a few hours to know what happened. After the treatment, in the case of good guide, we continue just with a few things, so such an analgesic, sedation, uh, sedation, nimodipine, and antipiletic we use in post-surgery. Um, obviously, uh, immediately or inside the, the surgical room, we see an uh, or an angiography to control is a, is a, is a good uh, clipping. Um, an RCT to, uh, to control, uh, transcranial Doppler, we did it every day, uh, and uh, as I said, uh, the damar drainage in all the patients. Uh, transcranial Doppler, very useful to prevent uh, or to control the, the vasus band. It's totally different the, the patients who, who progress because they are uh, critical patients and they, they need a lot of, of, of controls. Uh, well, and uh, there is a, a lot of paper about the, the treatment of these cases. Uh, uh, when craniotomy, the compressive craniotomy in surgical hemorrhage. In early surgery, just in poor grade, uh, when we perform the surgery, uh, we have the, the brain with uh, uh, swelling, and it's impossible to manage, uh, but we did it immediately. And after the surgery, if the condition of the ICP is, is high, uh, we will perform it. We, we know that it's the totally different the prognosis in a clinical compressive in a suicidal hemorrhage than in a traumatic patient because the, the, the pathology is different. We have here a problem of the, 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 the circulation of the vessels. is totally different. For that same time, uh, we discuss the, the, the convenience or not to, uh, to do it. But never after uh, 48 uh, hours. What, uh, uh, during the surgery, what we can do uh, to avoid complications? For example, uh, for example, open and clean the blood from fibular fissure. Sometimes helps, sometimes no. Open, open the lamina terminalis, interventricular catheters. There are a lot of publications in favor or not about this, this procedure. Sometimes we need, depending on the case, depending on the brain. Uh, there's publication, uh, a lot of publication uh, about uh, this. The management of anonymous with or without an hemorrhage is changing day to day. Medical and surgical treatment change and change in, in, in good form. A lot of publications appear continually, but they must read uh, uh, those papers and wait. We must wait evidence and new techniques and new drugs before we use them. Um, and for the, the last part of this presentation, is a uh, other point that uh, we always discuss, what we do with the elderly patients. The, uh, in my country, uh, Uruguay is a, a country where the, the patients live uh, a lot. The, uh, we have the, um, about uh, 80 uh, years old, the, the level of the, the middle age of the, the patients in, in, in my country. For that, we have a lot of patients uh, more from more than 70 years old with uh, cranial illness. 
And we must discuss with that what do we do with patient with a hemorrhage in a patient with an old patient. And what is old patient? Is only the age? No, it's a biological condition that we must uh, take. The age is not important. The important is the clinical condition and if they have or not uh, other pathologies. Uh, we did a paper about that. It was accepted now the Asian Journal of Neurosurgery. Uh, it was about uh, the surgery in the patients in the eighth and the ninth decades of life. The treatment uh, in this paper, all the patients was for cash classical surgery uh, for both rotor and, and rotor aneurysms. And has similar rates, this conclusion has similar rates of morbidity and mortality when compared with young patients. We strongly recommend the treatment of the pa this elderly patient. The outcome are good and let some patients undertake their previous activity in a significant number of cases. For that paper, we divide uh, the population in three groups. The first group for, uh, from 70 to 75 years old, the second group from 75 to 80, and the third group for more than 80 years old. And we divide <coughs> each group in uh, with pseudonym hemorrhage or without pseudonym hemorrhage. Uh, uh, in this period, we have 179 patients older than 70 years, 142 with uh, hemorrhage and 77, 77 without uh, a hemorrhage. Uh, this, this is the division. Most of them was in the third group and <coughs> 10 patients older than 80 years old. This is a typical sample. This uh, man uh, for who is 80 years old uh, consults uh, months ago because he was lost the vision. The, he was diagnostic, the, this big aneurysm. But the physician said, uh, the, neuro, the uh, colleague, the neurosurgeon said that he's a very old patient, we are not going to treat him. But uh, a few months later, he suffered uh, a hemorrhage. This is the aneurysm in, the, in this patient of 80 years old. Uh, you can see a very difficult aneurysm. This is the scan after surgery. It was a typical surgery. We need uh, many clips in tandem to uh, treat this aneurysm and the patient uh, recovered totally and uh, he, uh, I'm going not to, to show the, the surgery, but recovered and returned to their life. The patient uh, without cerebral hemorrhage, maybe this is the most difficult uh, group because it's not easy to decide a surgery in a patient with an hemorrhage without bleeding with more than 80 years. That happened in, a, in 10 patients in this case. But the results uh, were uh, good because the arteries of those patients uh, are sclerotic and they don't uh, uh, have more complications than young patients. Uh, this is a uh, young lady, 81 years old. Uh, she goes to the physician because she is uh, losing the vision uh, and appear this uh, big mass uh, here. Uh, the interest in this patient that 45 years ago she suffered an astronomical hemorrhage. She performed a surgery. Here you can see all clips in the other side. And now she has the, this big, big anemones who obviously are compressing the optic nerve <coughs> and losing the vision. We performed a classical surgery with a, also with a control, cervical control of carotid and uh, clip the aneurysm in, in, with many clips in tandem without, without problem, and the patient recovery uh, totally, and she uh, slowly was improving uh, her vision. Um, well, the, the percentage uh, was important, and the, this is the to end in the, the, the cost that is important. In the group of 70 to 75 years, we don't found difference between the results with younger patients. Uh, with surrounding hemorrhage, that are the percentage, and without those other percentages. In the group 75 to 80, we found a, a less more uh, percentage than young patients, but no difference in patients without surrounding hemorrhage. And in the, in the group of the more than 80, you can say that it's a small group, but representative. There is no difference 
and uh, unbelievable, but this is a result in the unrounded areas. For that, for us, uh, it's important to uh, perform surgeries in those patients because the surgery is there is no difference. It's just a 78 old man, uh, woman with a sonar hemorrhage, this big aneurysm. Uh, more of the patient with a uh, old patient has big aneurysm or giant aneurysm. Uh, this is a such you can see the dysplastic or atherosclerotic artery uh, carotid, the two clips in, in tandem, and the result of the patient in very good condition. In conclusion, in elder surgery, in elder patients, age and elder cases of life, surgery or both rotary and analysis, uh, are similar rates of morbidity and mortality when compared with young patients. We strongly recommend these patients. Thank you very much. You know, in study done in our ER, I think about 20 years ago, our misdiagnosis rate for subarachnoid hemorrhage was between 25% to 33%. And I'm curious, if we did the study again, would it have gone down because we improved the educational outreach or not? Just kind of an interesting question. Any questions from the audience? Yes. Yeah. Uh, the chairman of neurology. In your first slide about the diagnosis, you mentioned also neurologists. What percentage of those who use diagnosis are the neurologists? Seven percent. Seven percent. And then also, okay. as an expert, as a world class expert, what comments do you have for the neurologists to improve that seven percent? Uh, uh, the, the, the problem I, I, I think is that uh, they receive a lot of patients with headache. The headache is the most common uh, form of presentation of the cameras and it's the most common consultation in the neurologist uh, uh, outdoors uh, consultation. Sometimes uh, it's a patient is a patient who came three, four times, one year to treat today. Uh, the physician don't ask how it uh, uh, is. I think the most important is uh, try to separate the, the, the previous condition and to try to, to ask uh, to how was the, this today so, uh, which the patient is coming now. Then as a surgeon, when do you decide, or how do you decide to do clipping versus coiling on a patient? Uh, I think it, uh, uh, it depends on the experience of the, the surgeon and the department. In my department, we uh, strongly uh, are uh, in basic uh, classical surgery. But uh, we have endovascular, but uh, two endovascular we have at the research. And uh, for that reason, we uh, also uh, made surgery in posterior surgery. But sometimes, uh, uh, it's so difficult that we send them to the bathroom. Why? Because uh, uh, you can see the percentage of reopening of salary after coiling is about 40% uh, of the cases. Uh, they are changing uh, continually uh, with new devices because uh, all uh, the, the before devices uh, they are not have good results and uh, in the uh, the results of the blood from the special last year we found that the, the classical neurosurgery has 99 percent of occlusion uh, and the endovascular is 60 or 64 percent of the cases and uh, but uh, you need a neurosurgeon who work in vascular neurosurgery. It's not the same uh, if you have a neurosurgeon who made more than 50 uh, anonyms a year than other who made one or two uh, anonyms. Both sides for the vascular for classical surgery. Uh, uh, the problem is that uh, many times uh, a neurosurgeon who works in a, in a small hospital uh, receive one or two solar hemorrhage a year. And he don't want to send him to other hospitals. And he performed the surgery. In this case, the result is going not to be good because it's like it was the first time. 
Thank you. I want to thank everybody for coming. There will be resident presentations this afternoon. I want to particularly thank Dr. Tinsley for bringing all her students who I hope had a good educational experience. She promised me there's going to be a quiz on all the students. I'm going to ask you all about summer right now. Thank you very much. I want to thank all the speakers.